SolarWest, a stock that skyrocketed from 35 cents at IPO to around 142 today. That's more than 400% gain in a span of four years. One of the main reasons is the initiative taken by Malaysia to address the issue of climate change and aim to achieve net zero carbon emission by 2050. You see, one of the main contributors to carbon emissions comes from power generation, where most of it comes from burning coal and natural gas today. As we look for new green energy to replace dirty energy, solar became one of the obvious choices for Malaysia since we are able to get very consistent sunlight throughout the year. SolarWest is an innovative leader in the renewable energy sector, specialising in solar PV solutions. Their expertise spans from equipping homes and businesses with solar panels to developing large-scale solar farms. This growth doesn't stop there. Moving forward, they are also looking at midstream business where power produced by solar will be stored and downstream business of distributing those stored electricity to power up EVs and things like that. In order to find out if SolarVest is still a good growth company, I decided to speak to the Chief Strategy Officer of SolarVest, Mr. Leon Liu, to find out how far they can grow in this journey. Now, I understand that the interview may be difficult to catch the key points of what our guest has to say. So whenever Leon says something that I think will create value to shareholders, I will indicate it with this on the video. There are four of these indicators, so be sure to look out for them as you enjoy our conversation. Without further ado, here is the interview. I came across with this one very interesting company. It is just 10 years old, but surprisingly, it recorded highest revenue in their FY 2023. Uh, they made 365.5 million ringgit in that year. And they also made record-breaking net profit of 19.7 million in that year itself. So I thought it's exciting to look further into this company. Uh, usually, I will invite the CEO to come on the show uh, to talk about their business, but Today, I want to do it a little bit differently, and I'm very lucky to have the Chief Strategy Officer of the company, Mr. Leon Liu, to come and share with us about how SolarWest strategizes itself to fit into this ESG and green business. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Nonsik. Yeah, more than happy to be here, and hopefully we can support the sure. ESG agenda together. Sure, no problem. Uh, but let's get started by learn more about you a little bit, right? You graduated from University Technology Malaysia, majoring in mechanical engineering. After that, you went into Slumberger, which is an oil and gas company. Uh, subsequently, you go into Sarawak Energy Berhad, which is the Sarawak version of TNB here lah, in the peninsula Malaysia, before joining SolarWest as their chief strategy officer. What inspired you to go into renewable energy sector? Because you came from a brown energy side of things. I mean, upon graduation, I, I joined the oil and gas. Uh, we, we go to offshore all around the world, explore for the oil and develop the oil and gas. After some years offshore and in the oil and gas industry, I feel like uh, there are something more adventurous that we want to pursue. Because by then, I was still young. I was still around 30 years old. And I was looking out to do something more meaningful and... Uh, something beyond paycheck, something that uh, can get satisfaction from there. Wow. So after that, there's an opportunity back in my hometown in the utility sector. And if you look at Salawa alone, Salawa energy is very green by itself. And uh, Salawa is powered more than 80% by renewable energy by then, because mainly supported by the hydropower. So I took up the initiative, moved out from very technical engineering company to a more policy-related utility company, and uh, that's where I started my venture in the renewable energy industry. Right. How did the opportunity came to allow you to go into SolarWest and become their chief strategy officer? So when I was in Salawa Energy, we, we went to many conferences, and I came across this uh, SolarWest company in one of the conferences in KL. And I saw the company was not listed back then when I got to know them back in 2018. Mm. It was still not listed. And I met a few founders. We met Davis, Mr. Lim and Edmund. And they were very entrepreneur. I think two out of three of them coming from UTM. And we, we engaged and we met other quite often. The company is very, it's not big. It was growing. But it have a very strong uh, teamwork among the founders and the, and the employees in the company. And their, their message is very clear. They're doing solar at that time. And they were also one of the biggest, uh, I think they were biggest 
solar play in Malaysia. Mm. They were growing very fast from the large scale solar tendering process through FIT, large scale solar project. So I was very interested back then and we kept in touch. So after some times uh, we have been discussing for some years and uh, I see they were growing exponentially and it's a good platform to create impact to the society and the renewable energy. So I decided to move on and uh, came over and support the growth uh, of the company. Yeah. Right, so you decided to join them in yes. 20, 2021. 2021. Yeah. Right. Okay. So Solar Humvest is a company well known for solar EPCC. EPCC stands for Engineering, Procurement, Construction and Commissioning, right? Um, and you serve customers on the large scale solar project, the LSS project, like you mentioned just now, the commercial and industrial properties, and you also venture into residential these days, right? But Today, there are so many people doing solar EPCC. How is Solar West different from all these other players? So Solar West started as a contractor. By being a subcontractor, then we become main contractor like EPCC to handle the whole value chain of the project. But uh, as time goes by, the third record is the number one differentiation. We completed the most project in Malaysia today. We have completed more than uh, 1,000 megawatt and with zero fail rate. And most of the project that we completed is ahead of time. I think with the third record, we are already positioned uh, quite ahead of most of the players in the market. And since we were listed in 2019, we moved on from EPCC to become asset developer. What do you mean by asset developer? It's, uh, we own the asset, so we are not EPCC alone. Today, we also own the solar farm ourselves. Okay. So we understand what the customer need as a developer to offer them a better EPCC service. Because being a listed company, we have access to the more equity and uh, financing. So now we are also a developer ourselves. Mm. And at the same time, we still serve other developers as a partnership. And then we become the EPCC as well. So there's a, a certain kind of a leveraging in between. We are not just an EPCC today. We are at the partnership level to help a partner to deliver project as a joint developer, but at the same time to leverage our EPCC strength to okay. deliver the project. Yeah. Okay, so now you have two main income streams, right? I suppose one is you are still the main contractor in Malaysia to help all these customers to build their solar farm. Uh, so that one is on contract basis. If you don't have contract, you've got no revenue. But that is being offset by owning assets as well. Currently, how many megawatts do you have right now? We have uh, on hand completed about 50 megawatt. But uh, the one that we developed at the construction, I think by end of this year, we're going to have two, 300 megawatt. Two, but 300. we are targeting to reach about one gigawatt in 2025 or 2026. That's okay. our, our target. So we move out from EPCC. Our target revenues percentage will be 70% EPCC, 30% recurring income from the asset. That's what we target over the long term. Okay. Even beyond 2025, maybe we try to have 50-50. Like you mentioned, uh, EPCC is a one-off. So it's very hard to replenish the order book. Mm. And there is a lot of competitor keep coming in. And so we, we move on from EPCC to developer. So with the asset that we have, most of the asset concession is 21 to 25 years. So we're going to have a recurring income for the next 20, 25 years. And that allow us more time to think strategically and to develop a more long-term business. I also understand that apart from uh, becoming a developer, you also have other segments of the business as well. So I think to help us to understand a little bit better, I've prepared a board over here. Maybe you can help us to understand better in terms of the group's revenue breakdown. Right? If you can help us to draw how many percent is coming from EPCC, how many percent is from developing side, and is there any other business apart from these two? Maybe you can share with us. I think at the moment it's still mainly the it's still mainly the EPCC more than ninety percent I would say more than because, 90%, because the new okay. business venture is still growing. Okay. So if you look at it, uh, you can just see a very small pie coming from asset. Then the rest is still EPCC, but this is going to change. Uh, this is less than ten percent today, but this will grow up to twenty or thirty percent in few years time. So this will shrink to less than seventy percent. And other than this project, we are developing other technology as well. Maybe I'll explain a little bit on the other technology that we have. Mm. So I think we are looking at the whole clean energy landscape. Mm. And uh, solar is one of the energy, energy supply. So today, the whole Malaysia, I would say more than 40% is still supplied by coal. Another more than 40% supplied by gas. And uh, the remaining 10 over percent is supply combination of hydropower, solar, and uh, some biogas and biomass. So the whole solar landscape supply is still less than uh, 10% today. But uh, with the Malaysia policy going on, if you look at the new energy transition roadmap, 
we want to achieve 70% by 2050, I mean solar penetration to the grid. And in order to achieve that, because solar is intermittent, solar is only three to four hours a day. So when you have the sunlight, the generation go up. When you have a sunset, the generation go down. Yeah, rainy so, days also will go yes, down. Correct. So with the solar of five, 10 percent is okay. But when solar want to penetrate beyond 30 percent, the grid will be unstable. Right. You, you need all the power plant like coal and gas to ramp up and down. It will be very difficult for the grid operator to manage the grid operation. Mm. That's why the second business value chain we go into is energy storage. So we start with energy supply. The next one is energy storage. So energy storage has to be inside the picture. So when we talk about energy storage, we have a multiple option. Either you use a lithium battery as a storage or use a hydrogen system as a gas to store the energy. So these two are the energy storage solution that we are developing. We have done some pilot project in Salawa on the battery and the hydrogen system just to test out, build out the internal capacity. But the, this midstream is something that we are pursuing at the moment. So we have upstream of solar generation, then we have midstream of uh, energy storage. Then we have downstream. Downstream will be another three to five years uh, longer horizon. So downstream is how we use the green energy, electrification. So let's say previously the car, we use the oil to pump the car. But with the electrification from green energy, then we can store the energy. Now we can utilize the green energy in the car as well. So similar to the car, green data center, and there's a lot of application out there on the downstream. So downstream, we are developing into the electric vehicle infrastructure. That's what we are pursuing. Data center, we try to be involved in a data center developer market so that we can make sure the data center developed is consuming green power, 100% green power. So I think to summarize our long-term uh, five years roadmap is coming from upstream from solar generation, midstream of energy storage, battery hydrogen storage, up to the downstream of electric mobility, green data center. So this is a complete uh, ecosystem that we try to build. So Eventually, do you see yourself as a competitor to Tanaga, for example? Uh, not really. If you look at the most of the developed country, we call assist because Tanaga will still be the grid player. They will still own all the asset that transmit the power from one location to another, just like Sing Power. In Singapore, Sing Power manage all the transmission distribution network. They own the transmission line, they own the distribution line, they own all the substation and also the retail meter to all the consumer. But they are supported by a lot of uh, IPP and energy player. Mm. So in TMB here, we work closely. So they will still be the grid operator and we provide them all the green option. We supply them the energy storage solution and we supply the customer in terms of a consumption. So we call assist to each other. Speaking of ESG, mm -hmm. yes, no doubt solar is well known as one of the green energy. But if you think about it, right, in order to have significant amount of generation, you need a very big piece of land. And usually when all these companies, they take picture of their solar farm, it is in the middle of the jungle, whereby you suddenly see in the middle, suddenly bota, and then you put all the solar panel on top. Wouldn't that uh, defeat the purpose of doing this I, solar? I, I get the question a lot. So when I look at the, from utility and the industry point of view, when we look at energy supply, we look at energy option. So there's no perfect uh, energy supply there, but we look at the option that we have on hand. So today the energy option we have in Malaysia is uh, conventionally we burn a lot of coal, we mm. burn a lot of uh, gas. So this is the only supply source that we have. And hydropower, we have a little bit of it in West Malaysia, a lot in Salawa. But hydropower is not something that we can build. It depends on the yeah, geography. So we need to have a uh, right terrain, the two or three multiple sides of the terrain and then you cover out the other side with the hydro dam, then it becomes a hydropower. So the one that economically built can be built is mostly already built. And uh, there's still a little bit more to be built, but it won't, it won't create a significant amount of supply. Mm. So other than the coal, gas, and now we have uh, hydropower. So the last option is solar. So if you compare solar with gas or coal power plant, so let's say we compare the number. So one, one megawatt hour of power produced from coal, they will generate about half a ton of CO2. Mm. It's like 500 kilogram of CO2, it's, it's, it's a lot. So it means that one kilowatt hour of energy produced from coal, it will generate about half a kilogram of CO2. Okay. Actually one kilowatt hour of energy is not a lot. If you open the aircon for one hour, it's one kilowatt hour. Right. So if you turn on the aircon here for two hours, actually we are producing one kilogram of CO2 release mm. from the earth. So that is, what we get CO2 if we're burning the coal. So now if we use a solar, example, we use a solar. 
So one megawatt of solar farm, you need two acres of land. Mm. But one megawatt of solar is able to produce about 1,300 megawatt hour per year. So you can save about 600 ton of CO2 for that two acre of land. So if you compare with uh, CO2 save from the land to the CO2 you produce from the core, so I would say the solar impact is a lot higher. Right. Okay, okay. If, if you compare with the forest to solar farm, just now we said two acre of uh, land, two acre of forest, you become solar farm, you save about 600 mm. ton of CO2 per year, mm. right? But it's a forest, the amount of CO2 they absorb is only a few tons. So it's a few hundred times different in terms of a CO2 impact to I the see. environment. Trees, they, they absorb CO2, but the amount they absorb is very minimum. Compared to you convert that forest into a solar farm and you save the CO2 produced from the coal. Of course, this is a greener option. The other greener option is we don't use energy. But uh, <laughs> I mean, if mankind, we need to use energy for mm. our... So we have an option to choose. This is a two option that we have. And we don't have other option in Malaysia. We don't have wing. Some country like European country and uh, Philippines and Taiwan, mm. they have a lot of wing. So they put a lot of wing farm, wing mills to produce. So there's another option that we cannot enjoy. The other option that China and US, they use a lot is uh, nuclear. But nuclear, the risk is high, like Japan, there's a nuclear risk that is a very unlikely to happen, but, but once it happens, it's catastrophic. So we don't go to the extent to use nuclear power in Malaysia. So we are left with solar option as a green option to scale up. That's why solar become one of the primary clean energy provider by 2050 from the NETR. So would you say if, let's say like, to the extreme, we bring it to the extreme, all the forests in Malaysia will change it to solar panel. It is still the most green option for this country to actually produce this kind of green energy. If you look at the Malaysia power demand, uh, I think by only changing less than 1%, we can produce the, we can reach a 70% target right. of requirement of clean energy. Just like a, it's a very small percentage of the forest that we need in order to decarbonize the whole country. So it's, it's a comparison. Like, mm. It's not like we need to remove all the forests. It's not really, it's less than 1%. Okay, so just now you mentioned about currently you are on the upstream side of things, you are doing power generation, and then eventually you're going down to midstream storage, and then the downstream whereby you can distribute energy in terms of EV charger and things like that. Now, I think the strategy makes sense, and it's a natural progression of a company, but we cannot deny the fact that in every part of the business, the expertise that required is very different. But today, as you mentioned just now with this revenue breakdown over here, you are still, over 90% is still in the EPCC side of things. That means your expertise is here. So how do you strategize yourself to prepare the company moving forward to be able to provide that kind of expertise in midstream and also in downstream? Actually, from upstream to midstream is quite a natural kind of expertise. It's quite similar because uh, once a solar farm reaches certain scale, it will be mandatory to have battery energy storage with the solar farm in order to inject to the grid or inject to the factory. It will come uh, maybe in half a year to one year. It, it, it's a mandate. And the expertise that we need is still coming from electrical background. So we have started to prepare since last year. We have developed uh, a team of uh, specialists in battery. So our engineer, they cross skill from solar to battery energy storage. So they are able to design energy storage. They're going to understand how the electrical system work. And that's how we started a pilot project in Salawat as well. We have started to deploy some off-grid solution. We use a solar, become a battery. Then our engineer can start to try and error and also learn from the experience, their hands-on learning. So today I would say we already have a team ready to deploy big scale battery energy storage. And uh, upstream and midstream become a natural combination going forward. Right. So it's more on organic growth and a gradual upskilling of your engineers to be able to fit into midstream and downstream. Are you looking at MNAs, merger and acquisition, in order to help you to speed up the process? The immediate term in Malaysia is uh, for upstream to midstream, we don't look at MA, but there are certain other uh, planning that uh, if it happens naturally, we are still on the lookout, mm. but we haven't firmed up anything. At the moment, we are still building our internal expertise to support that because battery energy storage in Malaysia is still new. Of course, there is a lot of pioneer and strong player like in China and European or US. But uh, internally in Malaysia, we are still focusing on the internet expertise. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And where are you now in this five years roadmap? Can you give us some updates? 
So Solar, we are, we are there. We already moved on from EPCC to developer, which is mm -hmm. part of the fire roadmap. And battery energy storage and hydrogen system, we have uh, deployed some uh, record-breaking project in uh, Salawak. We power the first 5G tower using solar and hydrogen system as an energy storage. And our people is already built up, ready to tap the bigger market. So energy midstream, we are already there. In terms of the downstream, uh, we have a subsidiary called Power B. Power so B. Power B is set up to deploy infrastructure of uh, EV charger. So we are installing more than 30, 40 charger across condominium, public, and also our office. Uh, this is the downstream that we are still pursuing. Yeah. Is there a target for your Power B business? Like how many charging stations that you are aiming to do in the next five years? We set a two, 3,000 target uh, by 2025. And uh, the target is a moving target. It also depends on the government strategy, how they reduce the subsidy on the petrol, because petrol today is still heavily subsidized. But we believe the government have uh, intention to reduce the subsidy on the, on the T20 or M40. So those are the population that uh, we can target them to swap from petrol car to e EV car. So with more EV on the road, the infrastructure can uh, speed up from there. Right. Today, the petrol is still heavily subsidized. But we see a positive sign because petrol market, I mean, globally, petrol is going up, mm -hmm. USD is going up. So there's a right natural move to swap from petrol to electric car going forward. Mm. But how fast it can move from petrol to electric will depend on the policy and the market by then. Right. So policy is one yeah. key area for the success of the business. Huh? But apart from that, what would be the potential challenges in your five years roadmap that will stop you from doing what you want to do? I think policy play a very big important role. Like the uh, re recent government have a very strong policy to go de decarbonize. Because a lot of uh, multinational companies investing in Malaysia, they demand green energy. So government react and uh, they put a very good progressive roadmap to increase the amount of renewable into the grid. So if the policy is going as per plan, we believe the five years roadmap is quite clear okay. to be penetrated from there. If there is any changes in the policy or in the government, then it will slow down the whole thing. Because anytime there is a change in government, the policy will be delayed and there will be uh, some changes in the policy as well. So of course, industry will like stable government. Right. The government who put out a policy and we can move it through at least five or 10 years period. Right. So we can move things exponentially. So your biggest fear is GE16? Eh? <laughs> yeah, but I believe the current government look very stable You're and very we, like, stable. we like the current policy. Maybe, maybe one way to mitigate some of the risk mm. is to complete your five-year roadmap before GE16. Then at least yeah. you, are, you are there already, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, whatever policy they change, that will just tweak your business strategy a little bit mm. in the future. So other than Malaysia now, we also expand. In the five years, we also expand to overseas countries. Oh, where, so today, where are you? Today, we are in seven countries. So Malaysia still take up more than 90%, but slowly we are growing our overseas sector as well. For example, we are in uh, Taiwan, Indonesia, Brunei, Philippines, and Vietnam. So these are the countries that we have some project coming in mm -hmm. this financial year. And we closed some project also. We just started to move out last year after the COVID. So now we start to aggressively expand outside of Malaysia. We try to capture the Southeast Asia market so we can, uh, we can uh, balance up the profile uh, from mm. the region. Is yeah. it the same strategy like EPCC? Or yes. Oh, same, EPCC. It's more likely the same, uh, but we become developer mo mostly in overseas country. Right. So we are engaged a local developer. So from the EPCC, E can be conducted locally mm. in Malaysia because engineering we can do offshore right. and the procuring can be done offshore as well. Mm. So E and P we retain uh, in the Malaysia expertise and the construction and commissioning most likely we work with a local partner there with an M&E contractor in the neighboring countries. Yeah. Okay, so just now you mentioned a few countries like Taiwan, Singapore, Indonesia and all that. Out of all these countries, which one is your main focus market? At the moment, uh, we put the most resources, I would say, in Vietnam and Taiwan. So these two countries, the policy is very, very positive and they move exponentially. Taiwan and Vietnam is the countries that uh, we are thinking to see the real result very soon. So can I expect to see these two countries to contribute to your top line and bottom line this year itself? Yeah, or? it will be because of this calendar year, I think most likely it will. But for financial year, because we are closing Q1, so it will be... Uh, next financial year mostly. Okay. Yeah. 
the half year mark or yes. maybe towards the end of the year. I think towards the end. Uh, towards the end of 20, uh, calendar year 2024. Yes, 20, yeah, 20, yeah. Right. And just now you mentioned about putting more of the resources in these two countries. Um, when, when you mention resources, the first thing that comes to mind is money. So how much money are you putting in these markets? So a few months ago, we managed to raise a capital bond. So now we raised a 1 billion of uh, suku bond. 1 billion? Few, yeah, 1 okay. billion of suku bond. So from the bond, we allocated most of them still in Malaysia because Malaysia for us is still low risk, uh, stable market. So most of them will return in Malaysia and the rest, maybe 10, 20% we will use to allocate to these uh, external countries. But of course, if we have a solid project out there, we will still try to get the local financing and local partner to inject some equity to expand the market in overseas. Oh. But so I would say 80% is still will be in Malaysia mm. because most of our resources, know-how, people, contractor, and also the, the policy, we are the most familiar. Malaysia policy so far is still very positive for us to focus mm. in Malaysia market, which is uh, West and also East Malaysia side. How much is your coupon rate on that 1 billion ringgit? Uh, it's slightly above 5%. Yeah, about 5%. Yes. And that would mean your interest expenses, if you have the number up your mind, how much is that in ringgit term? No, because the suku bond is not something that, one, it's a 1 billion program, but we don't draw down. You don't draw down billion. immediately. We draw yeah. down based on project. Okay. So we have a sign off a project, we need fund for the project, only then we draw down for specific project. So the coupon rate differ depending on the drawdown, when we draw down the coupon mm. and number of years that we put on the coupon as well. So okay. now we leverage a lot on the the bond market to expand our asset. Right, right, right. Because when you mention 1 billion, my eyes suddenly open. Mm. Because if I look back your track record in your fundraising exercise, right, during your IPO time, which was end 2019, you raised only 34.59 million ringgit. Uh, most of it is used for working capital. Uh, one year later, uh, November 2020, you conducted a private placement. You also only just raised about 38.72 million ringgit. But of course, this time around, most of the money is used for solar PV projects. Mm -hmm. la. Subsequently, I think you also fully utilized all those money. Then you came up with the second tranche of uh, private placement. You raised 34.8 million ringgit, also mainly for uh, solar PV projects. So based on track record, when you need money, you always draw 30 over million, 30 over million like that. So um, to suddenly say that you come out with 1 billion ringgit, so that just shocked me a little bit. So then maybe my question would be, how long do you think you will take to actually fully draw down this 1 billion ringgit? If you look at the, the whole industry itself for, for clean energy industry, mm. the whole industry is just started mm. uh, these few years to go exponentially. After COVID, you slow down a little bit. That's why the company is growing. So we started with a few employees, 50 employees. Now we had 250 to 300 employees. So our scale is also growing. Initially from the private placement is used for the EPCC market. Mm. The EPCC market, you need some fund on the working capital. But since listed last year onward, we start to own the asset. When we own asset, it's a different kind of a capital requirement. So it tens of million. Now we need hundreds of million for asset. Solar asset is a very high volume game. So one solar farm can easily cost 100, 200 million. For 50 megawatt solar farm, going to cost 100 over million. And you're going to put the fund there, sitting there for 25 years, 20 to 25 years, and then you collect the recurring income from there. So solar is a, is a very big volume game with low margin. Because solar is very stable. Low risk is a very low return. Mm. But it's a, the risk is as low as a FD. I would say quite similar to fixed deposit uh, risk. Because you build a solar farm, you have insurance, Whatever happened, you have insurance to cover. And the solar never, I mean, we have sunlight throughout the year. It's, we, need, we never have a day without sunlight. That's why the generation is fixed. So because of the low risk, so naturally the return is very low. Mm. So that's why we need a lot of capital in order to fund the asset. And uh, that's why a few months ago, we started to have the bond exercise. So now with the 1 billion bond, actually you look at it, 1 billion bond, we can only build a few hundred megawatt of uh, solar mm. asset, which is not a lot if you look at what we want to achieve in Malaysia. So a few hundred megawatt asset is going to cost 1 billion. So as long as we can use the bond at the very low risk asset, we are able to get the reasonable amount of return from there to pay off the coupon that we draw down. And from there, we're going to do the next exercise after the bond. But now we are focused to draw down the loan maybe in next one, two years. Hopefully we can utilize the bond on all the meaningful and low risk asset. And after that, uh, we start to look at the next financing round. Eh? 
what is this future exercise that you are talking about? Can you share with us a little bit? Uh, we are still exploring multiple options. It can be another bond or it can be a different placement. It, it can be an international placement that uh, we try to look at strategic fund from pension fund from overseas or local. So mm. there is some uh, multiple options that we haven't finalized. I think I start to get some idea of your um, fundraising strategy. I think when it comes to asset development, because it has a very fixed amount of uh, return that you can generate from this solar PV. So you don't mind to go with debt financing. That's why you issue bonds and they do a back-to-back -back kind of yeah. financing. Uh, EPCC, because it's more risky, you don't know when you get jobs, when you don't. Can I say, if let's say one day you do more private placement or equity fundraising, it means that you are actually looking at the EPCC side of things more aggressively? Is that the case? Actually, uh, as we develop, even as an asset developer, the bond only supports 80% of the asset. 20% still has to come from the equity. So even we go to private placement, it mostly still fund the equity side because we are shifting the business from EPCC to developer. Because we see developer as a more, is a higher risk in the business segment, but higher return. You develop a project, you put some upfront investment, the risk is there. Maybe if the project is not happened, your upfront investment is gone. Mm. So developer is a higher risk, but higher return market. Once you get a project, you sub to the EPCC. EPCC margin is almost fixed and it's very competitive. Single digit uh, return and you have to take all the construction risk. That's why we are moving out from uh, EPCC to developer. There's another interesting thing about SolarWare since you joined in 2021 as the Chief Strategy Officer. And this is the new SolarWare Innovation Lab. Right. I understand that this lab is to power up startups companies in Malaysia. What is the objective of doing this? I think SolarVest, uh, we, we grow from the startup as well, from the few founders, and we see that there's a need to have more companies coming up to venture out and uh, grow eventually. We also would like to see more and more supply chain is coming from local player. So we have a more, because having a startup, growing a startup, it can create the economy spin off, right? Mm. You create employment, you improve the GDP for the country, and then you create a better industry locally. So we can bring out the the economy of uh, in Malaysia. And then we bring the economy up, then together we go overseas to penetrate the market. How many companies have you invested so far? Uh, this one I don't have an exact number, All right. but it's uh, governed by uh, our separate team on that. I okay. think a couple of few, we, we injected some capital. Right. Yeah. And what kind of businesses are these? Are they like similar, like you mentioned, part of the ecosystem, or it can also be something that is totally different from what you do? We didn't limit the thing, but it mainly depends mostly on the digital and the clean energy side. Okay. I think there are certain things like, so I, I used to see some pitching like from drone company, but drone is also used in our solar farm because we use drone to clean our panel, to monitor the panel, mm. because one solar farm is a few hundred acres. So there are some drone company, there are some digital software company, there are some uh, IoT vegetable company and something. Mm. We don't limit ourselves, as long as, but most of them are ESG related. That's the thing, right? Because again, you are a solar business, you have a clear mind of what you do in upstream, midstream, downstream. But when you put so much money into more businesses and they're small businesses, would it actually divert your attention away from your core business and would it become a disruption at the you end mean of the, the day? You mean the five years roadmap or the... No. The, oh, the innovation, oh, the innovation, innovation lab, lab, I would say we treat like a CSR activities. Right. It's not necessarily to complement our business. I it's see. more like a give back to the society, to tell the society that we are engineering company. So we support any engineering company. As long as the solution is there, we can be their mentor. It's, it's headed by one of our board members as mm -hmm. well, Mr. Gan. So he is the one who oversees the whole thing. Okay, so whatever you are doing, right? Um, actually, many MNCs, like let's say, for example, Schneider, they are also trying to build their green energy solution business. So how are you going to compete with all these big boys? Schneider is one of the solution providers. So they are technology company who build maybe the switch panel and some IoT system. So we are also buying some equipment from them or from most of the big players. So we all fit in different value chain in the clean energy roadmap. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say we compete, we complement each other. So there's a lot of big players like GE, Schneider, Siemens, and all these. They are all technology provider. And then we have a local developer who know the market very well and invest in local solar asset like us and a few other companies out there. And then there are some utility customer that we work with. So I would say we complement because the whole industry is growing. I think year to year is growing quite significantly. Compared to five years ago, you don't see 
uh, solar listed solar company you don't see solar giving employment or employability to the people but today solar in malaysia i think easily they employ more than 100,000 of people mm. if you combine the whole solar industry in malaysia hundreds of thousands of uh, employment just for the last uh, few years mm. five years ago i would say the employment maybe just less than few thousand for solar industry alone so it's a growing industry there's more and more partnership going up so I, would, I wouldn't say people compete with each other, but uh, I think partnership is very important to continue growing and push for more growth in this industry. Right. Since you come from oil and gas industry, I think you know that it is a common practice for foreign MNCs, oil and gas companies to JV with local companies to uh, tap on the oil resources here in Malaysia. Do you see that happening in the solar business and is SolarWest open to this kind of arrangement like how you used to do it during your oil and gas days? Oil and gas is, uh, because oil and gas was very policy driven. Mm. So in Malaysia, it's governed by Petronas, NPM. So they own the whole asset in Malaysia. Oil. They say any foreign player come in Malaysia, they JV and they do a, the PSC, petroleum sharing contract. They develop the oil and then they have revenue sharing because the whole oil is owned by one entity in order to better manage it efficiently. And uh, solar is different. I mean, sunlight is everywhere. Uh, anybody have the right to build solar farm. But uh, we do partner with some MNC as well, like uh, Total and some other oil company out there, like Petronas, Zentari. We, we are partner to develop some asset together also. Mm. But it's more like a support partnership. It's not a mandatory, but we see the synergy, so we partner each other. Okay. We have our value to add, and they have the value to add, so we partner up and develop the project. Okay, but so it's a different concept with oil and gas. Right. So my point is, uh, you won't think yourself as forming a JV 50-50 or 51-49, that kind of structure with the big boys. La. It's more like, let's go into a project mm -hmm. together, we finish it already, then let's find other things to do. Yeah. It's more like project basis. Right. But some of the company, we do form some JV in order to pursue some... Uh, some geography together. Mm. Uh, that, is, that is also one of our strategy as well. And as the chief strategy officer of the group, right? what keeps you awake at night? Uh, I like to think about the energy landscape. So I read a lot about uh, what is the latest technology out there and uh, what is the latest announcement in Malaysia policy. And also I have a lot of friends working in different parts of the world. I, we connect a lot and try to understand what is happening in their country so that uh, we can foresee what is coming in Malaysia for the next few years. Mm. So that is what I focus more. I think many investors are very optimistic about your industry and your business. Um, I think as long as you continue to push your five-year roadmap plan and let's say things work out well, uh, I think it is going to bring a lot of value to shareholders as well. Uh, I guess that's it. Is there any last word that you would like to share with the audience? No, I think SolarVest, uh, we are committed to decarbonization. So any party that keen to partner up or to grow the green energy uh, business, we are very happy to partner with. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks for coming to our show. And hopefully next time when we bring you up to the show again, you have more things to share with us about SolarVest. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sure. All Thanks. right. Thanks Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks.